Good evening, everyone. It is um, such a pleasure and a privilege to be with you all tonight. I'm Anna Westerstall Stemport, and I'm the Dean of the Great College of Liberal Arts at RIT. I would like to welcome you all to this presentation by Jason De Leon, Professor of Anthropology and Chicano Studies at UCLA. This presentation accompanies the Hostile Terrain 94 exhibit, which is currently on view at the RIT campus, and uh, you can see an, an image of it um, on, the, um, on the slide right now. This is a global pop-up exhibit designed by Professor De Leon, and it's organized by the Undocumented Migration Project, a research arts activism collaboration. Over 100 colleges and universities nationally and internationally are building and hosting these exhibits in 2021 and 22. Hostile Terrain 94 commemorates the undocumented border crossers who perished in the Sonora Desert in search of a better life. The work of enumerating those who died, walking in the desert to find others, helping in the identification efforts and compiling the information in a vast database was done over the years by Professor De Leon, students and collaborators. The exhibit itself is wholly collaborative and participatory. At RIT, the personal information of the three 1,200 people was written out by hand by over 100 volunteers on individual toe tags throughout the, uh, throughout the months of September and October. Then, over a four-day period, the tags were pinned to a large wall on campus, which maps the exact locations where uh, their remains were, were discovered. Tonight, Professor De Leon will help us understand the connections between U.S. immigration policies and migrant deaths. Hostile Terrain runs at RIT until January 11, 2022, which is the National Day of Human Trafficking Awareness. The exhibit is on view in the hallway next to the University Gallery, 2765 Booth Hall, and an augmented reality experience is available for viewers. Just hold your smartphone over the QR code on the wall sign. It is also... Um, a privilege and an honor for me to acknowledge the many co-sponsors of uh, this event uh, and uh, the exhibit. And uh, these include the College of Liberal Arts, the College of Art and Design, the Art Bridges Foundation, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and the Museum Studies Program. Professors Julie Decker and Christine Cray are the co-organizers co and I, uh, want to take a brief moment to, to recognize their extraordinary leadership and vision and commitment to this project and, uh, and the message and the stories and the commemoration that it entails. Thank you, Julie and Christine. With that, um, I'll turn it over to the co-organizers and uh, I look forward to being part of the conversation tonight. Thank you all. Thank you, Dean Stenport, very much. And now I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Connerly Casey, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Connerly, it's you. Okay, great, thank you. Today, I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce Jason de Leon and his talk, Land of Open Graves. An anthropologist, musician, and artist, Jason is one of the most compelling, provocative scholars of our time. Jason brings music and art into the core of his anthropology practices as both ways to understand and to make legible the lives of migrants and the everyday uh, violence of migration. His work is powerfully visceral and it clearly resonates with people around the world whose borders like ours have become increasingly fortified, policed and dangerous. For those of you just joining us, Jason is professor of, the, um, of anthropology in the Department of Anthropology and Chicano, Chicano and Central American Studies at UCLA. He's a recipient of the prestigious MacArthur Award, and he's the executive director of the Undocumented Migration Project, a research arts education collective studying and raising awareness about clandestine border migration between Latin America and the U.S., Today, Jason will shed light on the devastating human consequences of inhumane U.S. immigration policy as thousands of undocumented migrants die attempting to cross the Sonoran Desert from Mexico into the United States. Jason uses a potent combination of approaches, ethnographic, archaeological, forensic, linguistic, sonic, and visual, to study the lives of migrants while documenting and identifying the remains of those who have died, to offer some answers uh, for their families, 
But Jason also moves beyond doc documentation alone and memories of the past as forms of witnessing and testimony to viscerally tie us to particular people. As flies buzz over a dead body, then make their way for a vulture to pick it clean, these shocking effects, effective sensory reverberations stay with you. Who is this person? What happened? What dreams did they have? How do we treat people who seek asylum from violence or the opportunity to make a living? These are questions of humanity, relationships, and basic human rights. As we speak the name on a toe tag to place the person in the desert, we become part of a sonic, visual, linguistic relationship, memorable, repeatable, and full of sensorial experiential weight. Jason has not only started a conversation for us, but he keeps it going in sensory reverberations that connect us with those who have died. Let's welcome Jason, author of award-winning book, Land of Open Graves, Living and Dying on the Migrant uh, Trail, just published in 2015. Welcome, Jason. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you all so much for having me. I just want to say thank you so much to everyone. What Professor Casey did not mention uh, in her in her very generous introduction is that I was a really uh, kind of a terrible undergraduate in in two of her courses at at UCLA, um, but two courses that really um, inspired me uh, in so many ways. And I think that you know, as I've been trying to finish a, a book lately. Um, and I'm working on the introduction right now. And one of the things that I'm sort of talking about is what was it that brought me to to the type of anthropology that I do and to the subject matter that I'm studying? And and, and it really was um, two courses that I took with her um, as a student at UCLA. I was I was studying archaeology, but I was also very much interested in ethnography. And um, the the two sociocultural classes that I took with her really stuck with me and were were major parts of my decision to kind of redirect all of my energy um, later on after almost 10 years of doing archaeology to, to begin to explore, you know, the, the difficult subject matter around uh, migration and the brutalization of migrants. And so I'm always just deeply grateful to Professor Casey for um, for teaching such, a, such wonderful courses, for being so inspiring. And I'm, I'm sad that I cannot be uh, with her and and the rest of you uh, in Rochester today, but hopefully I can I can get there soon, maybe when this next book finally finally sees the, the light of day. Um, I'm also just want to say that I'm incredibly humbled that um, the Hustle 294 has happened there. Um, when the pandemic hit, we had major plans for a lot of things. And um, when uh, when things came to a screeching halt, we weren't really sure what was going to happen. Um, and so the fact that these shows are still happening, will continue to happen, is just a really humbling and inspiring experience. And I'm just grateful for all of you there who have engaged with, um, uh, with, with the work. Uh, so thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about hustle and trade today, and but also I want to give us some insight into, um, you know, into the migration processes that's currently experienced. And and I just wanted to start um, a little bit with with sort of contextualizing the, the state of affairs with um, with immigration right now. I think many of us thought that in this new current administration that things were going to be a lot different than what we had seen with 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 the Trump administration. Uh, but in many ways, it seems like um, we've continued some of the policies like the remain in Mexico um, policy that's forcing legal asylum seekers to stay um, in that country until their cases are being heard. But also what I would characterize as some fairly tone deaf uh, responses by this administration to this growing or this continued crisis that's been happening in um, in, in Central America, including a, a recent visit by our um, vice president to Central America, to Guatemala, where um, where Kamala Harris stands in front of a room of reporters and, and tells a country uh, of immigrants who are desperate to get out of there that they should not come to the U.S. Um, as if just telling people do not come, that that's somehow going to solve um, the global inequality that's been creating these issues for, for, for many, many decades. And we need to keep in mind that these places that we are that we are thinking about and talking about and telling people not to come from um, are, are places that are becoming increasingly unlivable. So we could think about the recent back-to-back -back hurricanes that have devastated um, Central America that's still in the process of trying to overcome the devastation of, of Hurricane Mitch in 1998. Um, many of the places that people are, are leaving from and have been leaving from you know, are underwater or are susceptible to, um, to some of the most extreme effects of, um, of our growing um, climatic crisis. These are also folks who are leaving places that are unlivable because of the violence. Um, you know, with El Salvador and Honduras consistently being in the top five for murders uh, in the United States, increasingly Venezuela being a new source of, of out migration for the United States. But these are places where people say, look, 
I know I can die in the desert, but I would rather die of my own free will than watch my kids starve to death or be murdered on a street corner in, a street corner in San Pedro Sula by a stranger. These are places that um, that are completely unlivable for, for a huge segment of those populations. And so um, when we tell people don't stay home, you know, they're, they're, their homes are underwater and their homes are, are bullet ridden. And so they are caught between a rock and a hard place. And I think like like most of us, they are making, you know, um, important, like most of us would, they are making important decisions to try to save their lives as well as the lives of their loved ones. So things that we need to keep in mind, and I'm happy to, to chat more about that um, in, in, in the Q&A. Um, and just to give us a little bit of architecture today for this for this talk, we'll do, we'll do about 30, 30 minutes of, of, of me jammering and then um, and then hopefully half an hour of, of, of Q&A. I'm going to talk about work that came from my, my first book, the, the Land of Open Graves, um, and but bring it more into the into this current moment. I want to give us a little bit of history on the Border Patrol policy known as prevention through deterrence. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about postmortem violence against migrant bodies, and then I'm going to do that through some stories around um, um, people who have unfortunately lost their lives during the migration process. And if you take away anything from this talk, um, I think it's just a couple of key points. Number one, with all of the, the discussion about a border wall um, that we've been having with the, in the last six to seven years, it's a ridiculous conversation. We have a border wall. It's called the Arizona Desert. It's killed thousands of people. We have a border wall. It's called the South Texas Backwoods. It's killed a lot of people. We have a border wall. It's called the, the entire country of Mexico that the U.S. now deploys as a way to stop migrants from Central America um, that is inherently way more effective than, than any kind of physical infrastructure we can build. Um, but I want to argue that these border walls that we have and these policies, they kill people. And it's not the people who are dying while migrating are not unintended consequences or collateral damage of this policy. They are the direct result of policies designed to put them in harm's way. And then finally, I want to talk about how this political violence or this violence that happens against migrant bodies is, in fact, incredibly political, but also has far reaching impacts um, around the globe. So just as an, an image warning, we're going to talk about migrant death today. So there will be a, a couple of, um, of, of images about that. But I just wanted to give people um, a little bit a little bit of a warning. Uh, the work that I'm going to talk about today, as Professor Casey mentioned, you know, it comes from um, from this long-term research project that I've been directing since 2009, the Undocumented Migration Project, which is me, in many ways, freely stealing methods and theories from a whole range of disciplines in pursuit of trying to understand and um, and and document the experiences that border crossers have um, while while migrating clandestinely. And so it's a mix of archaeology, forensic science, ethnography, photography, museum studies, and whatever else I can grab onto in hopes of telling uh, a, a more nuanced and, um, and compelling story. I am very, very happy to, to say that as of um, just, a, just a few months ago, the Undocumented Migration Project has um, jo officially joined forces with um, the Colibri Center for Human Rights, which is a, a Tucson-based nonprofit that focuses on direct services um, of, of trying to help families of the missing identify um, their loved ones' remains and be reunited with those individuals who have died while, while migrating. Um, this we're in the middle of this fusion right now. You can go to our website, uh, undocumentedmigrationproject.org. You can learn all about this new initiative that we're doing and the direct services that we're trying to provide for families. Uh, and we're also in the midst of a, of a big fall fundraiser. So if, if folks are interested in making a, a tax deductible donation to help us um, identify the thousands of people who have died while migrating through Arizona, uh, you know, we would greatly appreciate that. We have a silent auction that's that's currently up, and there's all, all kinds of other ways that you can um, both learn about our, our work and, and get involved by checking out our, our website. And so the, I guess the first thing is we have to understand how border crossings got with the way that it is. Um, prior to the 1990s, border crossings looked like this. People were hopping the fence in broad daylight in San Diego and El Paso and in, um, um, and in other parts of the border. And it's politically, you know, a, a difficult, a hard thing to explain away to constituents who are saying, I'm watching migrants hop the fence in my backyard. It feels like we're being overrun. And so there was a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment in the early 90s, a lot of push uh, against the Border Patrol to stop this, this very visible process. And so what they did was they basically lined up a whole bunch of agents on the ground, more, um, you know, a heightened physical presence in these urban zones and made it impossible to hop the fence and run into the United States. 
Um, so what happens is people who can no longer hop the fence at night and run past the border patrol keep getting caught, keep getting sent back, and they realize that that rather than trying to cross in one of these urban zones, they can go east or west for five or ten miles where the wall drops off, where there's no border patrol, and they can hop the fence there, cross into the United States, and then double back and try to get to where they're going. This policy that was a sort of very simple um, idea of heightened infrastructure in, in certain zones starts to become formalized in 1994, um, and it's given the name uh, Prevention Through Deterrence. And this policy is based on two very, very simple um, ideas. The first one is that the border patrol, uh, the, the U.S.-Mexico border is characterized by a lot of extreme and remote environments, so places where you can die from dehydration um, in the summer, freeze to death in the winter, drown in rushing, um, in rushing, water, rushing rivers, and big expanses of, of depopulated areas that are physically difficult to get across on foot. The second realization was that if we can push people away from urban zones like San Diego or El, El Paso and force them out into these remote areas, we can begin to use that natural landscape as an impediment to movement. And so the idea is if we disrupt traditional crossing places like in San Diego, we can force people over what the Border Patrol deemed, quote, more hostile terrain. So this is terrain where people would, would struggle to get across physically because they have to walk for, for dozens of miles through mountain ranges and, 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 and other extreme places where they can face physical danger, um, they can die from, from various um, effects of, of the natural environment, but they can also be captured relatively easily because they're in the middle of nowhere, they're easy to spot, and it's much harder, much easier to catch someone when, um, you know, when they're exhausted. And so this was a very simple idea that went into place in the, in the mid '90s, and this is our current security paradigm up to this up to this date. I mean, we are still using this now as the primary way to pol police our border. And the way that it began was we started sh shutting down these 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 areas in red um, with heightened infrastructure, and we left places like the back door of Southern Arizona pretty much wide open. And we tried to create this funnel effect. Let's push them away from these urban zones into a place like the Sonoran Desert. And so that's what we did and that's what we continue to do. This is a recent shot from uh, the US-Mexico border in a, in a town called Sasabe in Southern Arizona. This is about three miles from, um, three miles west of a port of entry where the wall literally just drops off. And granted this wall you can hop over if you're relatively fit in, in, a, in, a, in a couple of minutes, but you don't need to do that. You can just walk to the end of it and then, and then you're right into the United States. But the, but the issue is you still have to get across this, in, this enormous desert landscape. And so that's the idea. We don't need this vertical wall. We'll use a desert, we'll make this, this, this horizontal wall that now extends for miles and miles. And, and that really is the idea behind prevention through deterrence is that you can cross illegally into this country, but now you've got to get across this, this terrain on foot. And so we put, we put this into place in the 90s. Um, Arizona went from just having a couple hundred thousand or a, a couple thousand apprehensions in any given year, you know, probably under 20,000 people caught and deported to suddenly this funnel effect starts sending people towards Arizona. And now you've got hundreds of thousands of people coming through that area and being caught and deported, um, sometimes over six or seven hundred thousand at a time. And since the beginning of prevention through deterrence, you went from, yeah, averaging 10 to 20,000 people per year to now close to 7 million people have been apprehended while trying to cross through the Sonora Desert of Arizona. Coinciding with this is the fact that now you, you have a, a steep rise in people who are getting injured and who are dying as a result of exposure to this desert environment. Prior to, to prevention through deterrence, you know, we were averaging maybe 20 or 30 deaths along the entire U.S.-Mexico border during the course of one year. And now suddenly this goes into this goes into place in the mid 90s. We crashed the Mexican economy in the mid 90s with the North American Free Trade Agreement, which makes it unlivable for many people who, who then have to migrate to the United States for work. They end up coming to the Sonora Desert of Arizona and then they start dying in incredibly high numbers. And so you go from 10 to 20 deaths a year, um, maybe five to 10 deaths a year in Arizona alone to now suddenly hundreds of deaths a year. And um, since uh, the the beginning of prevention through deterrence, there's been over 3,600 recovered sets of human remains in Arizona alone. And I'm going to argue today that that's actually undercounting the number of folks who, who actually have died during this process. Uh, but as you can see, you know, in this graph and what I've just said, there's a direct positive correlation between prevention through deterrence goes into place, 
it pushes people into the Arizona desert and then migrant deaths spike. And they have continued to rise and rise. Uh, last year was one of the most deadly years on record in southern Arizona with 225 remains found. Um, the staff at Colibri tell me that we're, we're likely going to surpass this number this year for Arizona alone. And so even when migration flows have, have, have ebbed, have, have ebbed um, for various reasons, the economy is, is, is in the toilet, there's anti-immigrant rhetoric that some politician is spewing, those things can have slight effects on, on migration flows. But the deaths have continued to, to either to stay steady or to um, or to rise. And when you and when you start to map it out, you know, migrant death in the Arizona, it starts to look like like a killing field, like a, a, a true, you know, full blown humanitarian crisis happening on U.S. soil and a very troubling one. Uh, and as and because of this, you know, I've been really interested in in trying to raise awareness about the fact that thousands of people are dying during this process. And so, um, you know, Hostile Terrain 94 is one of those initiatives designed to raise awareness about this issue. And as many of you know, those of you who participated there at RIT, um, it's a pretty simple idea. It's a bunch of, of handwritten toe tags. The orange represent um, unidentified bodies. The manila represent those individuals that have names on them. And what we've asked you to do is to come into the, the, the gallery space or to a classroom and sit down and to fill out these tags by, um, by hand and to begin to write out the names of the dead and information for them. And the idea is that through the act of writing that you are, um, you're breathing life into this process, you're uh, into this, this phenomenon um, and, and you're bearing witness to, um, to, this, to this, this issue that seems to be happening in these invisible kinds of spaces. Here's a time-lapse video of a recent show at Mississippi State in, in Starksville, uh, Alabama. I'm sorry, M Mississippi. And here, you know, you can see students are using a grid that's on the wall that has the exact location of, of particular toe tags. And so they're going in there and geolocating those tags um, in, those, in those places. And my idea the whole time was, can we take this two-dimensional map of migrant death and make it into something three-dimensional? Can we can we breathe life into it through the act of, of witnessing, through the act of handwriting, um, to both bear witness to this process as well as to, to raise awareness and engage with it on, on, a, on a personal level? And so I'm just grateful that for all of you that have spent some time with this exhibition, and I hope that um, that those of you who, who were involved in, in filling out tags and, and mounting the exhibition we're able to to, to 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 get something from from that experience, um, and to hopefully take something away with you that will help you to think about these issues in a in in perhaps a a, a different kind of way than when you began the whole process. Um, as was mentioned, um, this is part of a global phenomenon that we imagine now by um, well, we, we set a cap at 150. We'll probably have 130 shows that will happen by the end of next year, and now we just keep adding more and more shows. So. Um, this thing may go on um, forever, uh, which I think is fine as long you know as long as, as people are dying in the desert. I think it's important for us to 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 to, to stay engaged and to maintain these these important conversations. Uh, but for me, it's a really thrilling and um, and incredibly humbling to see these shows happening all across North America, Latin America, um, you know, six continents uh, uh, globally, and people are engaging with this and finding ways to connect it to the issues that are happening in their own um, in their own communities. And so for the second half of this of this talk, I wanted to give you a kind of a setup for, for the, the policies that have led to all this death. I wanted to give you a little bit of insight into the exhibition work. And then for the last part of it, you know, I wanted to, um, to talk about what it looks like in the desert as well as, um, you know, how we can think about those who, who unfortunately don't, don't make it. This is Memo and Lucho. These are two men that, um, that I've written about extensively, um, migrants who I met in Mexico and whose stories I documented in my first book. And who, on one of their their last border crossing attempts, they documented the the process with with disposable film cameras. Uh, those guys would tell you if you're going to cross through the Sonor Desert of Arizona, which here is here is a, a partial map of it, you typically start in this, the town of Altar, which is a, a 
a major smuggling hub for both migrants and for drugs. Uh, so much so that the local baseball team are called the Coyotes of Altar. And in Spanish, Coyote is a, a euphemism for, for human smuggler. Migrants start there. They hop in a van. They're driven up to the U.S.-Mexico border, where then they will try to walk across the desert and try to get to a place like, like Tucson, which is about 65 miles north of, um, of the borderline. And they'll do that, do that on foot. Those folks who are walking across this desert will, will spend days, if not weeks, um, dealing with this extreme environment with, um, with temperatures in the summer above, you know, easily above the hundreds, above the hundred, above a hundred, um, with low, um, low water availability. So people are out there, you know, dying of thirst. They're also um, engaging with nature in all kinds of uh, really violent ways. There's, you know, lots of venomous in, in, uh, animals and insects and plant life that is, you know, has evolved to to poke, scratch, stick to your clothes, to make to make it a miserable zone to get through on foot. And people are doing this, um, you know, wearing sneakers, carrying a backpack with just a few a few personal items, maybe a little bit of water, as much water as they can carry, which is never enough for a multi-day um, trip through this through this environment. Um, so it's a brutal process that millions of people have gone through, and thousands of people have died while 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 doing it. And and I've become increasingly interested in the ways in which migrant death happens in this desert and how we can think about it as part of this larger um, political process. And so one of the things that I became really interested in early on was this idea of, of desert taphonomy. And taphonomy just refers to the ways in which a biological organism decomposes. And so whether it's the natural environment, you know, insects, microbes, water, those things that impact a body and make it decompose, or human processes of um, a cremation or, or digging a grave and, and burying someone, all of those processes are, are what we would refer, refer to as, as taphonomic. So both the cultural and the, um, the environmental or biological. And I've wanted to put those things into conversation with, with the deaths that happen with prevention through deterrence. But in order to understand migrant death in the desert, um, it, it took a little bit of ingenuity because there had been very little research when we began this project in 2009 on what happens to, to people who die. Most of what, what folks were telling me was really anecdotal, and there had been no systematic experiments on decomposition um, in this environment. And people just didn't really care. These were migrant deaths. These were undocumented folks. These were people that the federal government was ignoring. And so there wasn't a lot of social science research being, being paid to this. And so we began to, to conduct um, some forensic experiments using pigs as proxies for the human body, which is based on 50 years of of um, forensic science research where where pigs become stand-ins for humans because they have a similar organ distribution, a similar skin type, a similar weight. And so we can put them into different environmental contexts and watch them decompose or do things to their to their dead bodies and infer then what that would look like were, were, were those um, to be to be humans um, in that same context. And so we did this. Um, we had animals who were, were killed on site by by trained animal handlers. We then dressed these animals in clothes that we would expect migrants to be wearing, so darkly colored t-shirts, blue jeans, sneakers. We gave them personal effects, and we put them into different environmental contexts to see what, what it would look like um, when the bodies began to decompose. And to do that, we monitored these, an these, these animals with motion sensor cameras that recorded um, video and still images of the decomposition process over um, the course of many, many weeks. And what we found was very, very surprising and shocking. Um, so here's an example from an experiment in 2018. This animal has been dead for just a couple of hours. And then now this is what ha what it looks like se less than 72 hours later. The, the entire body skeleton is has it mo is mostly gone. We're left with just a few, um, uh, you know, we're left with the skull and um, a few other minor kind of skeletal elements. The shoes are still there. Um, all of the clothes have been ripped away and, and, and removed by scavengers and as has most of, of, of the skeleton. And so things were happening during these experiments that, that were really, really shocking to us because no one, no, one, no one had any data on this before we began this. And so when we started to do these experiments, it became clear that bodies decompose at a rapid rate, at a much quicker rate than any one of us could have imagined. And those bones are getting spread far and wide, sometimes hundreds of feet from the original death location. And many things were actually disappearing as well, be com completely missing. 
Um, and then we were having, you know, different impacts based on whether or not things were covered up with rocks or left in direct sunlight. Uh, one of the troubling revelations was the bodies we covered with rocks tended to be scavenged much quicker and disappear much faster because the rocks themselves were heating up the carcasses and that made scavenging a lot more attractive to um, to vultures, which make up 90, almost 99 percent of, of of scavenging impacts. So animals and nature are destroying these bodies really, really quickly. But but for the last part of this of this talk, I want to think about what's happening to these bodies in the desert in relationship to this policy of prevention through deterrence, but then also how we can think about the the the, the, the trauma that these bodies experience and how those deaths impact the, the, the lives of the living. And so I'll tell a couple of stories. And this happened just a couple of weeks after we began our first um, forensic experiments. The eight of us stand around her in silent awe. And it's obvious that not everybody in my group has seen a corpse before. Because someone gets up close to me and whispers, Is she really dead? She's lying face down in the dirt, and it appears that she's perished while attempting to get across, um, while attempting to get up a hill. To get here, she's easily walked over 40 miles and had to go through multiple mountain ranges. She's been dead only a few days and is in what forensic anthropologists term early decomposition. Gray to green discoloration, some flesh relatively fresh, bloating, brown to black discoloration of arms and legs. But these descriptions don't do justice to what bodies without in the desert look like, smell like, or sound like. Nothing does. After several days in the sweltering summer heat, this person's body has begun to change. Her skin has started to blacken and mummify, and the bloating is beginning to obscure some of her physical features. While parts of her are starting to transform into unfamiliar shapes and colors, her striking jet black hair and the ponytail holder wrapped around her wrist, they hint at the person that she once was. I ask a student to get a blanket out and we cover her up. It makes those of us still alive feel better. But high above her, turkey vultures circle her corpse. I try to write down some field notes. She's got no backpack or obvious personal possessions. She's holding a bottle of electrolyte fluids, but that's it. Later, I go and sit with, this, with the group of students while, while we wait, wait for the rest of our team to go get the police who take hours to get there. And while we sit underneath this tree, the silence among us is tense and only occasionally broken when a breeze comes through and rustles the branches of that mesquite tree. Out of the blue, someone cries uncontrollably and is immediately consoled by a neighbor's kind embrace. Others sigh deeply and someone walks off angrily to be alone in the distance. We sit quietly for what seems like an eternity while these vultures continue to circle overhead. They are simultaneously implicated in and oblivious to the complex human drama playing out below. All these animals know is that we've disrupted their lunch plans. But this is what prevention through deterrence looks like. This is the brutality that's happening in the desert right now. These are photos that that show that this humanitarian crisis is happening and that there just aren't enough witnesses out there. Susan Sontag once wrote that that we need that Americans go to exotic places to get full frontal views of the dead and dying. But I would argue that the dead live in our backyard. Sitting there on the dusty afternoon, I finally blurt out, at least we got to her before the vultures did. Her name was Carmita Maricela Zaguipuya, and she's on that wall at RIT. She was 30 years old when she left her uh, her family in Ecuador um, and tried to make it to the United States. She was abandoned by her smuggler after she became ill and was unable to continue walking. She likely died from a combination of hyperthermia and a pre-existing kidney condition. And one of the last things she said to her family in Ecuador was, quote, my kids are dying of hunger here. My kids are suffering. Whatever my destiny is, I must go. After finding her body, I made contact with Maricela's family in both New York and in Ecuador. And one of the themes of our many conversations revolved around the condition that her body was in when it came back to Ecuador. 
that her sister-in-law Christina and her best friend, who said that when when the coffin was returned to Ecuador, the medical examiner said, "Please don't open it. Her body's not in good condition." But of course, the family wanted to say goodbye. Christina wanted to change Maricela's clothes for the funeral. Her children wanted to to say goodbye to their mother. And so they opened the coffin, and it was a mess. She had been in the desert for almost a week. She'd been in cold storage for almost a month, unembalmed. Her body was completely destroyed. And so were her her family and her kids, who the last image of of their of their mother and of their sister and of their of their their spouse was this ravaged body in a wooden dripping coffin. And so I brought fo- Christina and the family wanted to see pictures of what her body looked like when it was when it was found. And so I brought photos to, uh, to Ecuador to show them and, and to hopefully bring them a little bit of comfort to the fact that, that they weren't, that she wasn't, you know, eaten by these animals. But Christina says to me, you know, even if this is her, you know, we thank God that we have her. It, it, it doesn't look like her and I don't want to believe that it's her, but if it is her, at least we have, we have her body. At least we can move forward. At least we have a grave that we can go visit. And she's right. At least they have a body. Because there are a lot of folks out there who don't have a body. At Colibri right now, we have over 3,300 open missing persons reports for Arizona alone. And we have over 1,300 unidentified bodies that, um, you know, that we have to raise money for in the private sector because the federal government does not want to touch this. So we have to raise the money to do the DNA analysis to try to, to identify these individuals. And that's a lot of people. And if you look at that wall that's up there at RIT, it's all of those orange tags that represent individuals who have not been returned home and families who are left uh, in, in limbo. And it really is limbo. Clinical psychologist Pauline Boss, she's got a, a, a phrase for this, for this type of trauma. It's called ambiguous loss. And it's, just, and it's a simple idea. It's the fact that when a loved one dies or goes away, disappears, and you don't know whether or not they are truly dead or alive, it leaves people in a perpetual state of, of, of grief. They can't begin the mourning process because they're never quite sure if that person is dead or not. And um, this, this had became an, an important you know, theoretical concept for the, the families of POWs um, after the Vietnam War. This has become important for families of the victims of 9-11 who have not been who have not been identified in the Twin Towers. And it's become an important concept for the thousands of families of missing migrants around the globe. And and I really thought that after Maricela's story, that that would be the, the end of this whole thing, that it could never get worse. But almost one year to the day that we found her body in the Arizona desert, Christina sent me this message on Facebook, which which was a simple message saying, can you please call us? We need your help. We have a relative who's gone missing. And so I became involved in another case of, of a migrant who, who had gone into the desert uh, and unfortunately had not, had not come out. And so I went to New York to interview families of this person that was missing. And this is an interview I did with a 13-year-old kid that I called Felipe, where he says, we were in the desert for five days and the water ran out. And Jose, my cousin, he kept stopping to drink what little water we had left but he was sick and he kept falling down. He couldn't walk anymore, he would just slump on the ground and, and, the, and the smuggler would come up and get mad at him and say, you need to get up or I'm going to beat you. But Jose couldn't move. He was sitting on the ground, looking all around, dazed. So this 13 year old kid did what he could. He gave his cousin what last little bit of water that he had. He helped him get situated under a tree and then he went to get help. And he was arrested two days later by, by the border patrol. The person he left behind was 15-year-old Jose Maria Tacuri. And I ended up spending a lot of time with Jose's pa- parents in, in New York and his family in Ecuador to try to understand where he had gone missing so that we could do a, a search for him, but also to try to understand you know, how this kid had come to be in this, in this predicament. And so I spent a lot of time with, with his family, uh, listening to them tell me about why their son um, was, was in the desert. This is an interview I did with Jose's dad. He says to me, when I was in Cuenca, Ecuador, Jose was my right hand. He was always with me. We were inseparable. 
But when I came to this country, he became a really rebellious child. I called him and I said, Jose, why have you changed? Jose was left, was left behind by his parents to be raised by an elderly grandmother. So he was out on the streets doing wild things that teenagers will do when they're left unsupervised. And so he says to his son, why have you changed? You used to be such a good boy. But Jose says to his dad, no, Papi, it's your fault. You left me. We were like brothers. You were my everything and you left me. It's your fault that I'm like this, he says. And his dad responds, I didn't come to New York because I wanted to. I came to New York because I wanted to get ahead. Because in Ecuador, I can't give you the things that you need. He says, I left when my son was 10 to provide for him and my family. But he didn't understand those things at the time. He just kept acting up. But he had everything there in Ecuador. But he would say that my wife and I were to blame. That he felt empty inside. That he would go home and we wouldn't be there. He told me that being reunited with us would fill the emptiness inside of him. So they finally decide to let Jose come to the United States. And the last phone conversation that Jose's dad had with him before he went into the desert um, was about something that he wanted to, that his son wanted to talk about. And so he says, "Papi, I really need to need to talk with you." And his dad says, "Well, okay. Well, well tell me what's bothering you." But he says, "Not like this." I want to do it face to face, like father and son. It had been five years since they had they had sat face to face. Five years since since they had hugged each other. And so his dad says, okay, it's not now, but when you get here, you can tell me what's bothering you. But then he says he never got a chance to do that. But I guess he had met a girl in Ecuador and they'd gone out. And they were together before he left and this girl got pregnant. I guess that is what my son wanted to tell me. That his girlfriend was pregnant and would I help him? Three months after Jose disappeared, his daughter Maria Jose was born. And his father says, That's the remorse that I have, that I could never tell my son that I was going to support him, that I was going to that I was going to be there for him and for his child. And and just knowing the grief that this family goes through and the and the, the heartbreak of this, you know has has stuck with me ever since that initial conversation. But I think in a lot of ways, it also really drives the work that we do, you know, the, the, the work to raise awareness about these issues and the work to identify these individuals. Because some days I think, well, maybe we've already found Jose's body. Maybe he's one of these 1,300 unidentified individuals that's on this wall, and we just need to find the, the resources to, to do the DNA analysis. So maybe we already have him. But even if we don't, that we have so many others. We have thousands of others who, who are in this predicament, people who just don't know what has happened to their loved ones. And so I think about that all the time. And it's, when, when things get tough and when it, this work gets depressing, it's, it's a motivating factor to just keep going and just knowing that if we can't find Jose, maybe we can, we can find somebody else. And finding just one more person, I think, would make this whole thing, this whole endeavor worthwhile. Because sitting there with his father on that day, it really was it was a conversation that that I've never been able to 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 shake um, at the time you know I was I had a child at the time a, a very young child under under one year of age and I was sort of having that anxiety of you have a small you have a baby and the worry is is this baby going to be okay and, and, and is, is it is everything going to be okay and I didn't realize until that baby got got older that Increasingly, I could care less about my own safety and well-being, because for me, the worst nightmare is something happening to the, to, to my children, and um, and I've really the, the this father telling me these stories and, and the grief that he was sharing with me have increasingly made more and more sense to me as I've gotten older. But at the same time, he gave me this look that that I can't. I can't really adequately describe this look of just deepest grief and sorrow that I think anybody could possibly harbor. Um, and like, I, I, I have, I have no words for it, but his father sits there with me on the, on this day. I'm, I remember just sitting on the couch with him and he's just trying to hold it together and I'm trying to hold it together. And he just says, look, we're trying to find anyone that might know something about where Jose is, but there's 
there's nothing that we can do right now to get back this joy that we have lost until we find him, to know something about him. He says, to lose my son like this and not know what has happened to him will make us cry for the rest of our lives. He says, every day that passes, we feel more and more out of control. Sometimes it feels like I'm losing the battle. I try to wake up with energy and say, we're going to find him today. We're going to find him. We're going to find him. But it's difficult to live like this, he says, to know nothing. And then he says, I just pray to God that we'll be reunited with Jose in one form or another. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason, uh, very much for your for your talk and um, so the broad swath of material that you covered and for orienting all of us on the call tonight. Dr. Christine Cray, my collaborator on this project, is on the Zoom and she'll be moderating the questions and posing the questions directly to Jason so that we can all hear the question and then um, the response as well. I'll turn things over to Dr. Cray right now. Thank you so much. We have one question here from, from John Asp, um, who is our the gallery coordinator who's been working with us. And he says, I remember seeing the documentary film Crossing Arizona made in 2005. Part of the film interviews locals who leave water in strategic places for crossing migrants and others who crudely sabotage those supplies. To your knowledge, is this still happening? Unfortunately, this is still happening. Um, and, you know, for a long time, it was the Border Patrol who was doing this. Um, and there had been denial by the Border Patrol that they, this was, in fact, not a, a practice that they were that they were encouraging. Uh, we started finding, you know, lots of smashed water bottles in the desert that had military style boot prints on them that had slash marks on them, um, you know, and we were inferring that it was in, that it was the Border Patrol doing that. But it wasn't until um, the humanitarian group No More Deaths was able to using those same type of trail cameras that we were using that they, you know, captured border patrol slashing water, pouring it out, um, you know, um, uh, stepping on these bottles um, that people started to realize, that, yeah, in fact, it is, it is the federal government who, who has been doing this. Um, they had, there had been a directive at one point saying that they weren't going to do it anymore. And this was under Obama. Um, I think it picked up again under Trump. And, you know, in recent years, in addition to, the the sabotaging of of supplies there just has been an increased scrutinization of humanitarians who are out there giving first aid to to people in need and so there's been you know there was a series of high profile arrests uh in the last couple of years and some federal court cases that revolved around both littering um you know by the leaving of water bottles as well as people being charged with um with aiding and abetting migrants um because they were providing them with um with with first aid in um, in the desert, um, and so it's still it, it's an ongoing you know sort of conversation. But I think as many um, of the humanitarians down there would argue that giving someone water in a in one of these death you know situations should never be considered a, a crime. Um, so there's a question here about um, about caravans, and you know the migrant caravans were very big under. Um, under the Trump administration, or at least they were big in terms of the media attention. Uh, we have to keep in mind that those caravans have been, you know, precede uh, Trump, and in the media they've been characterized as, um, you know, it, it has been drummed up by Democrats. This has been a way to undermine, you know, border policies, or um, these are publicity stunts. You have to keep in mind that, and we and we think back to in, in 2014, there was a moment where there were thousands of children who were showing up at the U.S. Mexico border asking for for refuge. All these kids start getting, you know, um, uh, end up on the news because they're inside of um, these detention centers, you know, covered in mylar blankets and they're freezing to death and, you know, they're by themselves in just kind of horrible conditions. The response to that, Obama at the time, you know, suddenly there was all these kids happening, at, showing up in the desert. Then they disappeared, um, or at least they stopped coming. And And Obama's kind of public response was, We've secured the U.S.-Mexico border and, you know, kind of problem solved. But what had really happened is that we had put all of this political pressure on Mexico to catch migrants at their southern border before they got up to the U.S.-Mexico border. 
And so um, in 2014, Mexico launched a program called Plan Frontera, Plan Frontera Sur, um, which was a way to just ramp up immigration enforcement efforts, deportations, checkpoints. So they're, suddenly they're catching all these kids in southern Mexico and, and sending them back. Um, at the same time, it's starting to make people migrate through Mexico in much more dangerous um, through the much more dangerous routes, uh, more remote places, jungles, um, mountains where they're subject now to extreme um, or heightened extortion by by drug cartels and transnational gangs. They're being um, abused by by federal agents. And so Plan Frontera Sur suddenly makes it um, um, way more dangerous to cross Mexico and people are dying and disappearing and getting assaulted in, in really high numbers. And so in order to deal with that, Migrants in Central America decided that that there would be strength in numbers, and so that and and it happened. And so much of it has been um, really informal and organic. People are in a migrant shelter in Guatemala or or southern Mexico, and and they're hearing these stories about being abused, and they just say, "Look, if a hundred of us go together, it'll be harder for people to abuse us. So let's just get together and we'll walk in mass. And that way, if we get attacked, we at least can defend ourselves in some way, shape or form. And we can also bring awareness to the abuses that we're experiencing um, through media engagement. So that's that's where these caravans really were a direct response to um, to heightened security and brutalization that really is, is resulting from from U.S political pressure on on Mexico but we, we've compl- like like many other things around migration we've completely demonized these things we've completely constructed our own narratives about what we think they are um, to suit uh, p- political agendas but there is no um, you know conspiracy in Honduras or in Mexico to, to make these caravans as a way to like you know invade the United States I mean th- those n- there's nothing about it that's organized it's all mom and I mean these are people who are desperate who are who are just trying to stay alive, and so they are doing anything they can um, um, to survive. And these caravans happen to just be a way a, a way to do that. But at the same time, these caravans are not um, impervious to abuses. I mean, people get kidnapped from these caravans. There, there's been journalists who have been disappeared during this process. Um, so even in, w- in these large groups of, of of individuals moving together, people are still dying and getting hurt uh, in the process. Here's a question: Do you see a professor? So the, the question is, you touched on it briefly, but it's my impression that these remains that have been discovered must be only a fraction of the tragic loss that happens in the desert. Do we have an idea about how high the larger number of deaths could be? Um, I think for Arizona, you could probably, you could safely double those numbers and you might even be able to triple those numbers. Um, and the, you know, it doesn't include the nightmare that's happening in South Texas right now um, or the things that are beginning to happen in in southern new mexico where there's just not a lot of attention to these things but if you look if you look at the hostile terrain map um there's a big empty area on the left side of the map sort of on the western part of the state and when you look at all these toe tags on that map it sort of implies that that that's somehow a safe zone or migrants aren't crossing through there or, or nothing is really happening in that in that empty white that empty white space what that space actually represents is an enormous federal bombing range. That's the Barry Goldwater testing range, where um, you know it's a it's a military facility with little access for civilians. And so most of the people that 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 die and are and are found in Arizona are found because hikers are out there doing their hiking thing and they come across remains because humanitarian groups, mom and pop groups are out there looking for people, and they're they're the ones who are finding these bodies. There's no concerted effort by the federal government to look for these remains. Those groups are now only starting to get access to Barry Goldwater. And as they've been doing that more and more, they're finding bodies practically on, on every single trip out there. And so I think you could fill in that whole, probably fill in that whole area with a lot of um, um, deceased individuals. And if you look at, there's a book called um, Dead in Their Tracks that was written by a, a, a photojournalist named John Anarino 15, 20 years ago. And in that book, they're flying over the Barry Goldwater testing range in a, in a Cessna. And from the plane, he's taking pictures of identified skeletal remains on the surface, you know, human bones, skulls that are out there. And he's saying to the Border Patrol, what about these remains? And people are saying, well, it's just really remote to get out there. It's a lot of paperwork and a lot of trouble to go all the way out there to get those things. So what's the, you know, they're just there. What's what's the what's the bother? Um, and so I think that's been kind of the the attitude about this particular part of the Arizona desert. So, you know, and if you so if you fill 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 that in 
with what it looks like in the rest of that that map, I mean, you're easily add, adding a, a thousand or more people just to that that zone alone. Um, and then there's lots of other places where people just aren't where, where you're finding some human remains, but you know, folks are just disappearing because of the um, because of scavenging and other and other environmental conditions. And so, um, I think the numbers are significantly higher than we're currently reporting. Thank you, Professor De Leon. So thank you all, everyone, and thank you to my um, co-organizer. Thank you to Dr. Casey. Thank you to our co-sponsors. Again, the College of Liberal Arts, the College of Art and Design, the Art Bridges Foundation, the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and the Museum Studies Program. Um, we have a final comment here. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. You are a true humanitarian, and we will try to live up to your example. What a very nice way to, to end this conversation. So thank you all again. Uh, please go see the exhibit. Um, and we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you all.